Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Choosing the Right Industrial Cybersecurity Framework. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of the event today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. If you are experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Our speaker will reply via email. Click on the Resources widget at the bottom of your console for pertinent materials. You will also be able to download the slide deck from today's presentation via that widget. Please take a few minutes to answer our three-question survey. You will find the survey widget at the bottom of your console. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast. So now, let's get on with the presentation. Our speaker today is Robert Landavazo. Robert is a systems engineer at Tripwire, where he focuses on helping customers secure their industrial control systems. He has a background in the electric utility sector, most recently working to implement a NERC critical infrastructure, SIP, internal compliance program, leveraging Tripwire's own product suite. While at this utility, Robert worked in operations technology to support SCADA in distribution, transmission, and generation. So now, without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Robert Landavazo. Hello, thanks for joining today's webcast. My name is Robert Landavazo. I'm a security engineer for Tripwire, where I focus on helping our customers secure their industrial control system environments. Today we'll be talking about choosing the right industrial cybersecurity framework. We'll start off with just a brief review of the agenda. We're going to begin today talking about why industrial cybersecurity is relevant uh, with a few categories of interest. Then we'll move on to an introduction of uh, what makes cybersecurity frameworks important uh, and starting with a strong foundation for them. And then we'll move into what exactly a framework is in the first place. Sounds kind of backwards, but it'll make sense as we go through it. Then we'll talk about industrial cybersecurity frameworks, frameworks that were built just for this purpose. And then lastly, we'll just briefly describe some of Tripwire's capabilities to help you implement a cybersecurity framework. So industrial control system security can be a rather complex endeavor for many businesses already faced with ensuring their control system uptime requirements and the enablement of resiliency. Progressive technology convergence changes have led to an increase in the number of industrial control system and supervisory control and data acquisition components using commercial off-the-shelf stuff like Microsoft Windows, Unix operating systems, and IP network protocols. The technological differences between IT and OT that had traditionally kept these different disciplines separate are now rapidly disappearing. It's no longer sufficient to rely on the proprietary nature of the technologies used within the industrial automation sector to provide an appropriate level of security. Industrial control systems now face increased threats from unauthorized users, misuse, including even uh, accidental employee behavior, for example, and malicious software, such as malware and ransomware, typically found in IT environments. Consequently, an ICS cybersecurity control framework really needs to be an integral part of every organization's overall security strategy. So now we'll transition to uh, talking about why a strong foundation is important to your industrial cybersecurity practice. Security controls can be considered on three tiers. First off, foundational, then fundamental, and lastly, advanced. The mistake too many organizations make is focus on the latest, most advanced technologies and even buzzwords with things such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and even the blockchain, 
thinking this stuff is going to help them keep ahead of cyber threats. The vast majority of the most common threats can actually be prevented by focusing on foundational and security control processes. Why is that? Well, attackers are looking for the easy way in, and most often this means exploding well-known vectors like unpatched vulnerabilities on Windows HMIs and misconfigured assets with Telnet enabled. These foundational security components are what make up the most part of the core of every single cybersecurity framework for the most part, industrial or otherwise. Once you've got the basic uh, processes in place, you can add fundamental security controls to further reduce the risk and implement the most advanced techniques after you have the basics firmly in place. But to eliminate the most risk and get the biggest bang for your security buck, you should obviously consider more advanced options as your organization matures and your security budget increases accordingly. So the bottom line here really is that foundational controls truly assure cyber integrity. And what does that mean to us in the industrial space? Obviously, uptime and resiliency are top of mind. But safety is, of course, at the core of what we're doing. The components that make up the foundation that we haven't really touched on yet are vulnerability management, asset management, configuration management, and change management. All of these, of course, are components of every industrial cybersecurity framework. We've talked about foundational controls now quite a bit, and really, I think probably what we're interested in finding is what do we get from them? Well. First and foremost, 91% uh, of all security breaches can be detected by the foundational controls alone. Um, next up, we want to obviously uh, enable proactive monitoring of our OT networks. Thirdly, uh, we want to obviously be compliant uh, with regulatory requirements if we are subject to them. Um, next up, we want to reduce the mean time to detection to one day or less, and obviously uh, what comes with that is mean time to restoration as well, shortening that window, of course. Um, solving regulatory requirements kind of ties back to uh, our compliance assurance. Uh, we want to reduce expenses, of course, and lastly, we want to find uh, configuration drift in our environments. All right, so we've built up our foundation. Uh, now we're ready to put a cybersecurity framework on top of it. Well, what exactly is that? We'll hope to answer that uh, in the next few minutes. So bear with me a moment here. I know that at first glance, uh, it looks like it came straight out of an IT department, uh, but that's for a reason. Of course, uh, it should be no surprise that even industrial cybersecurity frameworks, for their most part, have their roots uh, that were planted in uh, regulations and guidelines and control frameworks and standards that came from IT folks. And of course, most frameworks that are used for prescriptive guidance to address security and compliance focus on the foundational control that we've talked about. And those controls drive integrity. If you use one of these frameworks for compliance or have in the past or know of them, then you understand some of the benefits of these integrity controls. So let's look at an example from the CIS or Center for Internet Security's uh, 20 critical security controls. All right, so now focusing on the first six, uh, it's gonna help you prevent incidents and reduce risk. And notice that five of the first six controls align with integrity management as we've described it up to this point. So by implementing these controls first, you can prevent and detect 91% of the breaches in addition to achieving compliance and passing audits, if that's your thing. Uh, but really, the key takeaway here is that uh, cyber integrity controls are all components of the most uh, common control frameworks. Uh, in fact, all of those that I've come across, and uh, particularly so the industrial-focused ones as well. All right, so now onto the fun stuff. We can pivot into talking about some of the actual industrial cybersecurity. Okay, so I know this might be a little bit of an eye chart for the short period of time it's going to be on the screen, but don't worry. Uh, we're going to be dissecting each row over the next few slides in excruciating detail. Just kidding, we've only got enough time to scrape the surface. 
And with that in mind, uh, this list of frameworks I put together is just that. So I handpicked what I think is a really good sampling of what's available out there, uh, from the very mature to the relatively new, uh, but know that there's a lot more out there. So if you're in a particular industry that's not represented in the industry column, uh, don't fret. Uh, there may or may not be more available to you. So just a quick Google search will, will re reveal what's out there, uh, and I'd be happy to assist you in locating a framework for your industry if one exists. Um, so we'll move. All right, so let's start off with the AWWA or American Water Works Association. Um, based on recommendations they received in the 2008 Roadmap to Secure Industrial Control Systems in the Water Sector, the AWWA's Water Utility Council uh, took action to develop a cybersecurity resource designed to provide actionable information uh, to the actual utility owner operators based on their uses of their process control systems. So uh, that is the purpose of the process control system security guidance for the water sector, and it's supporting use case tool, both of which you can freely download from their website. Uh, the use case tool helps utilities uh, spec out which components of the guide are applicable to their environment, which is a, a really handy addition uh, to the deliverables that came from, from that effort. Uh, the AWWA's resources um, were recognized, actually, by the Water Sector Coordinating Council and the US EPA as the foundation of what really is a voluntary sector-specific approach for adopting the NIST cybersecurity framework. So um, even then, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework was, was, of course, created in response to executive Order 13636, uh, titled Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity, which was signed by uh, the president in uh, 2013. So all in all, uh, this requires uh, a commitment to action as part of an all-hazards risk management strategy as recommended by the NCAWWA G430, Security Practices for Operations and Management. Um, the AWWA security guidance uh, and tool of, are, of course, living documents, so um, we should expect updates from, from them um, as need be. And uh, they're, of course, uh, now taking input from users on, on where those documents sh should go. So very exciting things happening uh, in this particular industry vertical, thanks to the AWWA and the efforts they put into that uh, that document and supporting tool. So, of course, this is a, a, a non-regulated industry, so uh, adoption of this tool is completely voluntary. Um, I would like to note that uh, Tripwire, of course, has canned uh, content available for download um, to help enable our customers in this space uh, comply with, uh, with the uh, framework and guidance that's published by them. Okay, so next up we've got ANSI slash ISA 62443, which is a series of standards, technical reports, and related information that define procedures for implementing electronically secure industrial automation and control systems. So that's a mouthful. Uh, this guidance applies to end users, i.e. asset owners themselves, system integrators, security practitioners, and control system manufacturers responsible for manufacturing, implementing, or managing industrial automation control systems. So very wide applicability. These documents were originally referred to as ANSI slash ISA 99, or just ISA 99 standards, as they were created by the International Society for Automation and then publicly released as American National Standards Institute, or ANSI documents. In 2010, they were renumbered to be the ANSI slash ISA 62443 series. This change was intended to align the ISA and ANSI document numbering with the corresponding International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC, standards. ISA 99 remains the name of the Industrial Automation Control System Security Committee of the ISA. Since 2002, that very committee has been developing a multi-part series of standards and technical reports on the subject of industrial automation and control system security. The documents that are created as a result 
are then resubmitted to the ISA approval uh, for approval and then published under ANSI. They are then also submitted to IEC for consideration as standard and specifications in the IEC 62443 series of international standards following the IEC standards development process. So uh, all ISA 62443 standards and technical reports are organized into four general categories called general policies and procedures, system, and finally component. So personally, uh, I see this set of standards probably most commonly out in the wild within Tripwire's customer base for both clients with and without industry-specific industrial cybersecurity frameworks available to them. That is, of course, probably due to the fact that standards were generally built uh, to be widely applicable. Uh, once again, Tripwire does have content available to customers interested in adopting this particular standard. Now on to something a little different. Uh, notice that this framework is for regulated entities. In this case, for nuclear generator licensees that are required to protect digital computer and communication systems and networks performing the following categories of functions uh, from those cyber attacks that would act to modify, destroy, or compromise the integrity or confidentiality of data and or software that I access the system services or data and impact the operation of networks and associated equipment. So what are those categories? They're safety related um, and important to safety functions. Second, security functions. Third, emergency preparedness functions, including offsite communications. Four, supporting systems and equipment, which if compromised would adversely impact safety, security, or emergency preparedness functions. So yep, granted, uh, that's straight out of the requirement itself, so a little wordy, but hopefully that gives you an idea of, of the wide breadth of the applicability of this requirement uh, for licensees. Uh, so NEI 0809 uh, describes a defensive strategy that consists of defensive architecture and a set of security controls that are based, again, on the NIST SB 882 uh, final public draft uh, from 2008, the Guide to Industrial Control System Security. And of course, NIST SP 853 Revision 2, titled Recommended Security Controls for Federal Information System Standards. Um, the NEI 0809 uh, 2010 Version 2 controls contained in the NEI 0809 Tendencies D and E are, of course, tailored for use in nuclear facilities and, again, are based on NIST SB 882 and 853. So a running theme here that we're going to find is that even the industrial cybersecurity frameworks are grounded, again, in um, IT cybersecurity frameworks, um, more often than not, published by NIST themselves. So interesting tidbit there. Again, uh, Tripwire content is, in fact, available for uh, this set of requirements. Now for one uh, that has matured to be similar to the NEI framework in that its applicability is for power utilities and it's undergone lots of changes that we'll talk about briefly here. Um, utilities do not have a choice on whether or not to be compliant with this requirement, presuming uh, they meet the requirements set forth by the impact uh, rating criteria uh, for either low, medium, or high impact. Um, so, a little bit of history here. The NERC cybersecurity standards first appeared around 2003 with NERC Urgent Action 1200, which was also known as the NERC Cybersecurity Standards, or CSS. So, like all NERC standards before passage of the Electro Electric Power Act of 2005, companies uh, only had to comply with them uh, if they so chose to, so they were completely voluntary. The standards applied only control centers at, to only control centers at that time. Uh, they were later replaced by UA1300, which now applies uh, to generation as well as control centers. Um, after passage of the EP Act, the UA1300 standards were submitted to FERC as SIP002 through SIP009 in August of 2006. After issuing what's referred to as a NOPER, or Notice of Proposed Rulemaking in July of 2007, FERC approved those standards as SIP version 1 in January of 2008. 
in a landmark uh, order 706. Um, this is when things got real for utilities and it was no longer voluntary to, to comply with them. Um, so I'm not typically one to praise the government in its efforts to impose requirements on, on businesses, but in this case, uh, there's been a ra rather positive effect on the industry. And, and, you know, having come from the industry myself, pat ourselves on the back and say that uh, we're light years ahead of very similar uh, organizations and industries uh, in parallel verticals. So we, we perhaps do have the government to thank for uh, requiring these uh, public and private utilities to uh, comply with the NERC SIP standards. So. So now for another set of standards, uh, more akin to the IEC ISA 6443 standards we talked about previously, in that they have a very wide applicability with no vertical specialization, meaning you could uh, very well uh, deploy them and they'd be a very good fit within uh, discrete manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, utility, um, you name it. So uh, the National Institutes uh, of Standards and Technologies Special Publication 800-82 provides guidance on how to improve the security of your industrial control system, uh, including supervisory control and data acquisition systems, or SCADA, distribution control systems, or DCS, and other control system configurations, such as like even standalone programmable logic controllers, for example, um, while uh, of course, addressing the unique performance, reliability, and safety requirements uh, of those systems. So very in tune with the unique requirements of the industrial space. Um, so SP, or Special Publication 800-82, uh, really focuses on four components. First, providing an overview of industrial control systems uh, and systems system topology, so some really good reference architectures there if you're unsure of uh, how to lay out your industrial network. Uh, two, identify typical threats to organizations, mission, and business functions supported by ICS, so give you some really good insight there. Third, uh, describe typical vulnerabilities in ICS, uh, so of course how you could um, properly secure your environment against those most common vulnerabilities. Uh, and lastly, provides recommended security controls, which really are safeguards and countermeasures to responding to all of the associated risks. Again, note here that uh, Tripwire does absolutely have content uh, available for this requirement in our library. Okay, on to the final framework we'll be reviewing today, and that's the Department of Homeland Security's Transportation System Sector Cybersecurity Framework Implementation Guide. Uh, and this, this guidance also has a companion workbook um, that the two provide uh, an approach for transportation system sector owners and operators to apply the tenets of the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, or NIST, Cybersecurity Framework. So once again, uh, we see the foundation of this framework being uh, the NIST cybersecurity controls. Um, specifically, uh, organizations may use the implementation guidance to characterize their current security posture, um, identify opportunities for enhancing existing cyber risk management programs, um, find existing tools, standards, and guides to support the framework uh, implementation itself, and lastly, communicate their risk management issues to internal and external stakeholders. So uh, organizations operating uh, public transportation that lack a formal uh, cybersecurity risk management program could potentially use this guidance to uh, establish risk-based cyber priorities. So uh, you know, while, again, that's the last uh, framework we're reviewing today, know that uh, there are, again, many others out there available to you uh, that could be applicable to your your very own uh, vertical, so to speak. So don't hesitate to spend some time uh, Googling and looking for what's available out there. Or again, of course, reach out to us at Tripwire, and we'd be happy to help you locate uh, a relevant framework for you. Okay, so now on to the actual work of selecting a cybersecurity framework. So. Um, let's go after the low-hanging fruit. Obviously, if you're a regulated utility, you don't have much of a choice. Uh, it's already been selected for you. Um, secondly, go after the low-hanging fruit. If you're 
uh, in an industrial vertical that already has a purpose-built cybersecurity framework, you obviously uh, might consider starting there. Um, but there are some caveats, of course. If you're a utility, you uh, might have uh, components of your business that don't really aren't really a good fit uh, for the requirements that you're subject to. So you might consider um, implementing uh, a different framework for a different environment that's more applicable. Um, and the same is true for other verticals as well. So uh, don't put your blinders on and, and stick with one, but uh, unless it makes absolute sense to do so. But uh, look beyond just, just what you have to do and, and see what else is out there available to you. Uh, so now more, more generic advice in that uh, locating an, an ideal ICS data security control framework um, ideally should have some characteristics. And first off, you know, it needs to be adaptive and comprehensive in its approach to, to dealing with emerging cyber threats. So address the, the ICS business requirements like availability, integrity, safety, resilience, et cetera, of control systems. It, it needs to, to, to fit well in, in that regard. Uh, next up, it, it needs to uh, meet the risk management and performance requirements of, of typical control systems. So uh, you can't fit a, a round uh, peg into a square hole, and you shouldn't try and force a, your cybersecurity framework uh, in the same fashion. Next up, uh, it should be scalable. The uh, ICS security framework you choose um, can and should be used by the organization to establish their whole program, uh, including OT, operational security policies and procedures, and risk and control frameworks, which can then be further used for security and risk assessment initiatives of the organization and their industrial assets. So ultimately, asset owners and operators uh, can and should uh, be able to, to build on their, whatever SCADA or cybersecurity framework they choose um, to form what I think of as a short, medium, and long-term security plans by selecting not only the right framework, but the appropriate accompanying tools and training and, and other technologies to to, to secure their OT infrastructures. So I just wanted to spend a few moments talking a little bit more about what Tripwire's capabilities are in this space. Obviously, applying the control suggested uh, by each of these respective frameworks can be an overwhelming task, especially if you're starting from scratch. But don't let that discourage you. Uh, Tripwire, for example, has some really fantastic tools in its portfolio that can assist with the implementation. So for industrial control systems and their associated environments, we obviously recommend a layered approach to security. And really, the first step to building security into the OT network uh, starts with access control and zoning and conduits, uh, which, of course, is right out of the pages of IEC 62443, that terminology. Um, but you can use firewalls and network equipment uh, from our parent company, Belden, which has a very robust portfolio uh, that caters to uh, that space. And uh, on the right-hand side here, we'll, we can see the, the tripwire portfolio, which we really separate into uh, three kind of characteristics. The first one being passive, which is about collecting uh, security data from your environment and log information from your environment uh, to discover assets and do investigations on, on network issues and misconfigurations and configuration drift uh, and all, all things of that nature. Then we've got periodic, which includes you know, scheduled assessments uh, against vulnerabilities and configurations uh, that need to be addressed to keep your environment secure. And then lastly, we have uh, continuous, which is highest level of security, where you can use solutions that alert you to changes in the environment that could compromise your network security. So lastly, I wanted to share with you uh, Tripwire's industrial cybersecurity framework library. And really what we're looking at here is just a screenshot uh, of some of the content that we have uh, immediately available within our library. And you know, notice that uh, we've filtered down here to 268 unique policies currently available for download that uh, are catered just to the industrial cybersecurity frameworks like ISA, AWWA, NEI, NERC, and NIST, all of which we uh, reviewed briefly today. So uh, very robust. 
uh, library available to you here with uh, an unfiltered total list of, of more than 2,000 policies available. So um, whether you're just beginning your journey or, or, or a seasoned pro uh, with regard to implementing cybersecurity frameworks, uh, know that uh, TRIPR has a very bus, robust capabilities and solutions in the space. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to you uh, joining us on a future webinar. Thanks. Have a great day. I'd like to thank our presenter, Robert Landavazzo, for his very informative presentation. And thank you, our audience, for attending. We hope that you found the presentation informative and useful to you. I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of the webcast. Also, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for this webcast, please respond to that follow-up email. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts. Check the schedule at tripwire.com. Thank you, and have a great day.